Uh, I'm 66 years old. I live in Half Moon, New York with my wife. I've met Glenn in 1987. We then got married in 1997. And he has two older children, and then we adopted two children ourselves from Guatemala. And now we have three granddaughters. Started my career in 1973, working at a retail toy store. I just retired a few months ago. We've been spending all of our time organizing and renovating the, the house. It's a 25-year-old farmhouse, so that's been uh, time-consuming uh, and expensive, uh, but a lot of fun. In the fall of 1998, I had an episode at the warehouse where I passed out uh, on the warehouse floor, which was, you know, something very unusual and hadn't happened be to me before. Prior to that, and uh, they did a bunch of testing. It turns out that I have ventricular tachycardia, which is what they call it, at the, uh, where you get an irregular heartbeat that goes so fast that your blood can't actually go through your heart because it's pumping so fast there's no flow. My name is Glenn, and I've had a heart transplant. My father passed away at 50 uh, from heart-related issues. He had a brother who passed away at 52 from heart-related issues. And their mother, my grandmother, passed away at 74 from heart-related issues. I was first diagnosed with cardiomyopathy, I'm going to say, in 1980-ish, 81, 82. Initially, there was no impediment to my lifestyle whatsoever, so I, I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. Cardiomyopathy is when a patient's heart function is just not normal, and when you say heart failure, it means that they're very symptomatic. They can't breathe. They're having trouble with the heart that they have. The human heart is, is simply a pump. Uh, it has two sides, it has a left and a right side, and top chamber and bottom chamber on both. The right side pumps blood to the lungs and through the lungs, and then the left side collects that blood and then pumps that oxygenated blood to the rest of your body, to your brain, your kidneys, uh, etc. There are a number of reasons that, that people can go into severe heart failure, and we divide them into two general categories, ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is due to coronary artery disease or blockages in the arteries causing heart attacks, which then causes decreased heart function, or non-ischemic, which is sort of a catch-all for a number of different uh, causes of heart failure, most of which we actually don't understand. But it can be simple things like uh, common viruses. The, the, all viruses that we've heard of, such as the common cold, can end up causing heart failure in people. I was fortunate. I, I got to the hospital and, and you know they diagnosed it and put me on medicine and they put in an ICD at that time. ICD is essentially an implantable pacemaker that can actually shock the heart back into a normal rhythm. It was working fine. I think I adjusted over time, but you know, you need to do things a little bit differently than maybe you did them when you were in your 40s. You, you tend to slow down a little bit. But I still was working 50 to 60 hours a week consistently, five, six days a week, doing outdoor yard work and so on and so forth, right up until you know the fall of 2016. Hey, how are you doing today? Alex, good, how are nice you? Nice to see you, nice to, to see, see you, you enjoying uh, Oh, some beautiful Kevin. weather. Yes. Nice to meet you. Yes. There's enough dark color in this shingle to give contrast to the two shades that you have here, and there's enough of green in both of these. I'm 41 years old. I'm from Clinton, New York. I'm a golf course superintendent and love the game. I am married to Sonia. We have a daughter, Charlie, that is two years old. My name is Jordan. 
and I've had a heart transplant. At 32 years old, I was visiting my father at Tampa General where I passed out onto the floor and the doctors rushed me into the ER and found that I had a blood clot in my heart and did an emergency open heart surgery to remove the clot. I came to and found out that I was on the same hospital floor as my father who had just had an LVAD placed in him which would end up pumping his heart for him. An LVAD, or left ventricular assist device, is a mechanical pump that really essentially replaces the function of the left side of the heart. After spending a week at Tampa General, the doctors concluded that I had cardiomyopathy. All of this was a huge shock to us as I had had no symptoms leading up to this. A couple years following my open heart surgery, the doctors okay. decided I need to be Good implanted job. with a pacemaker yeah, defibrillator. Yeah. Do you like it? You stole daddy's quesadilla. <laughs> quesadilla. After being implanted, my heart function slowly kept declining. This really was a challenging time, um, you know, especially after I found out I was pregnant and Jordan shortly thereafter had his LVAD placed into his heart and he had very limited things that he can do throughout the day. Even after being implanted with the LVAD, my heart still declined to a 9% function, which led me to not even be able to go to the mailbox to get my mail pick up my daughter. It really bothered him seeing me have to take on some of the roles where he would normally step in and would love to do that. Oh, hi, baby. <laughs> Are you ready to do night? Want me to take a nap with you? Let's all go take a nap. Let's all go to night. So in the fall of 2016, essentially I had an infection in my bloodstream. I went to the hospital to get treatment for this infection, which had manifested itself in the wires of the ICD unit in my heart. And that was the issue. So they needed to remove the ICD unit and the wires in order to uh, eliminate the infection. Then things went downhill fairly quickly. Ejection fraction is just a measure on an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart, showing how much the heart squeezes and how much blood it ejects. So the normal ejection fraction would be 65 uh, or greater percent of the blood that the left ventricle, the lower chamber on the left, collects, it then ejects. Obviously as you get lower, you, you can get into worsening heart failure. The majority of people that we transplant have ejection fractions that are 25 percent or less. I was running about 35%, 39%, I guess, in the fall of 2016. And by the time they put me on the transplant list, it was down to 13%. People who have severe heart failure, they're you know, people in the hospital admitted to the ICU. The likelihood they will survive a year is probably only about 25%. You only need to do this one piece here. A patient needs a heart transplant when the heart that they've been given just no longer is working. Let's put this on here, on the seam here, so we know where it goes. It'll be flat that way. They can't yes, breathe, they can't sense. think, they can't do anything. They're in and out of the hospital. They have no quality of life. Their other organs are beginning to fail, their kidneys, their lungs. Heart transplant is a uh, very supply-limited problem. We in the United States and the rest of the world have a major donor shortage. In this country today, there are probably 200 to 300,000 people uh, who have end-stage heart failure and theoretically could uh, qualify for a heart transplant. Now, you, you look at the numbers in this country and we do essentially 3,500 heart transplants a year. 
There you go. Okay. Nice job. When I first found out he needed a heart transplant, I we were told at that point, without one, he only had six months to live. It's very stressful on the caregiver or the partner of the person who's sick. I found myself always trying to be positive and calm and not showing the stress that I would go through because you have to do everything you can to try to keep the patient calm and, and positive. Yeah. Roll. <laughs> so it's a lot to take in on the inside and not show it on the outside. I was in the hospital. They said you could plan on being here for somewhere between 45 and 90 days before you could get a heart. The wait time for a heart transplant uh, can be uh, quite variable, um, and it all depends on your status uh, for the, on the heart transplant wait list. And so the status goes from status one to seven. If you are status one, your wait time is going to be exceedingly short uh, with the new allocation system, probably within a week, maybe less. But you, if you get down to status four, five, and six, where a lot of patients sit, it can be uh, a long time. First, we match patients with a, a donor. Obviously, it has to be a blood type compatible and size compatible. You know, you can't use a five foot donor for a six foot seven uh, recipient. So those are the first two. And then we do a lot of immunologic testing on both the donor and the recipient prior to transplant. And we match uh, those two together uh, as best we can. Then we have a national system uh, that is essentially automated that sends out the offer to different centers around the country. So strategizing the right donor and the right recipient and where those two uh, people are is extremely important. For best outcomes, the heart that is taken from a donor needs to be in the recipient and beating within about four hours. Imagine trying to do a transplant, you know, with the hearts in Miami and the recipients in New York. That requires a lot of operations in terms of ambulances, planes, teams, and a very fast, good surgeon on your end to get that heart in and beating on time. So this four hour window is very, very hard to meet. We have to say no to a lot of hearts that are out there in the country because they're not in big cities or near airports. One of the most important advancements that we've had uh, in many years for heart transplantation is, again, what I would call ex vivo perfusion. Uh, we actually put the heart on a device uh, that then perfuses that heart with warm oxygenated blood. Uh, the heart actually, uh, while being transported and waiting to be implanted, is actually beating, is not quite uh, like being uh, in the human body, but the heart is actually much happier uh, and allows us to go much longer times uh, without uh, having significant negative issues. And you can take that heart in this machine and you can go 12 hours with it and then get it to your hospital and then implant. And that's a major advance in being able to get at this question of how far can we get donors from it. So we can now, from Durham, North Carolina, we can fly to Wyoming. Uh, we can fly to Puerto Rico for good donors. Uh, and, you know, again, that was never possible uh, prior to that uh, technological advancement. We have used the FDA-approved device now since 2016, and it has allowed us to travel further and consider hearts that we may not have thought about before. This hopefully will increase our uh, donor pool and get more people transplanted sooner with good hearts. They were doing a trial study for this heart in a box, they called it. It was something relatively new at the time, so I signed up for it.
So when I was told that it would be two to four years to wait for a heart transplant, and Charlie now in her life, I knew I had to take matters into my own hand. I came across a clinical trial that was being held at a couple institutions across the country, hoping that I could get picked. I was only at 9% heart function, and it came back that I was accepted. Uh, I was very shocked, happy, and then telling me I could be anywhere from tomorrow to a week having a heart. I was scared, excited, nervous. Four days later, laying on my couch around 11 o'clock at night, phone rang and I was asleep. So I answered it and lo and behold, that I had a woman on the other line telling me, we have a heart for Jordan and I immediately ran and he was sleeping right here on the couch. I woke up to her shaking me and screaming. And she said, they have a heart for you. And then I went in for surgery. Most patients, when they get the call that we have a suitable donor uh, for them, are, are excited and nervous. I was terrified, honestly. You know, this isn't your you know everyday surgery. This is a heart transplant, you know, so it was very, very overwhelming. You know, praying the whole entire time that Jordan was able to get through the, the heart transplant. Just pick it up and put it in, Charlie. Yes, the mommy does. Come here, Charlie. Yeah, you could just put it in the hole. There you go! When I finally did hear from the doctor that everything went well and Jordan was in recovery, I think I just started crying and I was just so overwhelmed with you know great happiness and joy knowing that he was gonna pull through and he's gonna be able to live this normal life that we had dreamt about for several years. So I saw him right after his surgery and I was pleasantly surprised at how great Jordan looked. Honestly, I think it was just uh, the blood circulating, you know, better in his, in his body. I spent 11 days in the hospital for recovery and then, then I came home to Charlie to start our new life. Every single time a patient goes into the operating room and comes back out with a new heart, it is just the most incredible thing. We cheer for them, we clap when they wake up and get taken off the breathing tube when they look up. You're, you're hugging them, you're so excited for them because it's, it truly is a miracle. And you, it, it never gets old. It was four days later, they came back uh, around dinner time and said, we, we have a match. If this is, all works out, we're gonna do the operation first thing in the morning. So when we found out the heart was available, of course everybody is so excited and happy, but uh, you were also very, very nervous and, and scared of, of the outcome. I didn't know where it was coming from. They don't give you any of those details, but I know that it was out of the region, so they needed to transport it via plane, train, or some other. So I was ready and uh, went down to surgery at six o'clock. Of course, it was a very long day emotionally. The transplant itself took about eight hours. And I was in recovery until about 10 o'clock at night, I believe, at which time I was able to see my family. Seeing Glenn for the first time after uh, transplant, wow. Um, relief, obviously, um, excited for him, but the main thing I can think of is just shock at how well he looked and how responsive he was. It was amazing, it was just amazing. There's hundreds of thousands of patients who've received organ transplants in the United States or across the world. It's good long-term survival, it's good quality of life. It's not that complicated, it's, it's not weird or different. It's just a kind of medical surgical therapy that's highly successful that gives people their lives back. There's no other way that transplant can happen without people doing that for other people. Organ donation is probably the most important thing you can do as an individual, in my opinion. It's something that you can leave. It costs you nothing. You don't have to plan for it. You don't have to save for it. You don't have to sacrifice for it. You just do it, and there's nothing but benefits for everybody else, the rest of mankind.
It's critically important that uh, uh, we all check the yes box on our driver's license to say that we will be donors. And just as important, it's critically important that we talk to our family members about our wishes to donate organs and save lives. What I've learned from meeting some of these families who've donated the organs of their child or their spouse or their brother or sister is that it actually makes them feel a lot better. That ultimately there's some meaning out of maybe a senseless death and there's some sort of closure or happiness that, that, that someone in their worst moments of suffering, they were able to save the lives of up to seven or eight people. We've been very fortunate to get this uh, gift, so we do spend a fair amount of time giving back. Glenn became a heart brother almost immediately after meeting us. My name is Patrick, and I have a heart transplant, and I'm the co-founder of the Heart Brothers Foundation. My best friend and partner in this journey was Bob Romer. They were in the hospital together for well over a year, uh, waiting for transplant, and when they finally were transplanted, they started this organization to help other patients that are going through heart transplant. The mission became simple. We assist heart failure patients and their loved ones through a life with heart failure and all its challenges. People actually sit with people in their hospital rooms that are in the process of getting a transplant or have just been transplanted. Both Debbie and I are volunteers, so we do work directly with patients that are going through heart failure early stage all the way up until they get a transplant and beyond. I think that the work that we're doing there is to try to educate people that heart failure is not something that happens one day and it's over with and you need to see the doctors, you need to follow the advice and the outcomes are more often than not better than you could have expected when you heard that you, you know, are going into heart failure or you have heart failure. Bottom line, we fill gaps and we supply hope to the hopeless. Move it on slide, honey. Come on, mama. The very first year after transplant, patients, you're really spending that year really learning how to be a transplant recipient. There's a lot of tests, there's a lot of doctor's visits, there's some heart biopsies and other ways in which we assess how the heart is doing. And so there's a lot to learn and they're trying to get to know their own body again. Hey Charlie, look at me. Hi honey. The majority of patients do very well. You know, we, we look at a lot of different things in terms of what success really means. Okay, okay. We generally look at survival. And so the one-year survival in this country of heart transplant is about 93 or 94%, which is excellent. Go over here. Come over. Obviously, we do our best to pick the best hearts possible for patients so that they can go on to lead a totally normal life. Kids go back to college, people get married, women can have children despite having a heart transplant, as long as it's well supervised. Uh, people travel. Give me get her, Charlie. Oh, no, I Living with a new heart from my donor is amazing. With modern medicine and technology, I'm very excited for what the future brings. Life after transplant has been terrific. I'm healthier, I, I lost about 20 to 25 pounds, walking 20 to 25 miles a week. We just bought a, an RV motorhome. So we plan on doing a cross country trip, hopefully uh, next year. This is our home on wheels for several months a year, we hope. And spending much more time with the family and especially the grandkids. We're doing much more active things than we were doing even while we were working.